partner with Yahoo Finance. The latest edition of the external sector report from the International Monetary Fund shows global lending and borrowing increased last year on net for the third year in a row. So-called global current account balances, or the balance of payments made between one country and another, widen as commodity prices soared amid the war in Ukraine and as economies continue to recover from the pandemic. As the U.S. Federal Reserve and other central banks around the world mounted aggressive interest rate hiking campaigns, the U.S. dollar appreciated, currency markets saw significant volatility and capital flowed from emerging markets to advanced economies. So what will this year hold? How does the IMF see capital flows and exports and imports playing out this year at a time when global growth is projected to slow further? For a deep dive into this report and the outlook, I want to bring in one of the authors of the report, Assistant Director at the IMF's Research Department, Jawu Li. Mark Sobel, U.S. Chairman at the official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum and forum, former U.S. Treasury official and member of the IMF board, and all the way from Singapore, Danny Kwa, Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. Gentlemen, welcome. It's great to be with you here at IMF HQ. Glad to be here. Jawu, you were one of the authors of this report. Let me start with you. And let's just explain that a current account uh, is really just the balance of payments between one country and another. It's really a summary of financial transactions between a country and other countries. And those financial transactions can include uh, investment inflows and outflows, uh, borrowing and exports and imports. So having said that, global current account balances have increased for mm -hmm. the past three years. Mm -hmm. What's really been driving this trend in your view amidst the global pandemic and geopolitical developments? So I'll actually start with what you just said. One of the main contributor was the pandemic, sharp downturn at the beginning of the pandemic, and then uh, equally swift re rebound from that. That was one important factor that opened up the global current account balances. Others would be the war in Ukraine and the effect that it had on the commodity market, in particular, commodity prices, oil, gas, and food items. That was another. And most recently, rapid tightening of U.S. monetary policy. That, that would have been the third factor. But having said that, some expansion in what we call global current account balances, mm -hmm. which, again, as you said very nicely, uh, reflects investment flows and goods flows, some expansion is a welcome development because we all want countries to be trading goods, services, and money. In a way, we can say that something like a, a Goldilocks level of global current account balances. What we would watch out for is too much or too little changes in global current account balances. From that angle, the expansion for the past several years considering all the disturbances in global economy, is not necessarily a concerning development on its own, but as always, these developments need monitoring and we pay a careful, we put a careful watch on it. Uh, Danny, you're in Singapore, you're on the ground over there, you've got a front row seat to emerging markets and capital flows. What do you think has really been driving this trend? We are paying a lot of attention to what IMF says in these reports. And one thing that comes clear to us as we try and think about what's driving the widening global balance is that we want to be sure to communicate that a widening global balance is not a perfect indicator of the health of our part of the world, nor should it be viewed as a perfect steering wheel to correct whatever uh, shortcomings we might be seeing in this part of the world. So I like very much the way that the both of you, uh, Jay Wu and Jennifer, have said that global balance is not necessarily a negative development. We acknowledge in this part of the world that is, as our economies here go through natural stages of growth and adjustment, at different times, they will want to be borrowing and lending. And that's natural and appropriate. And if borrowing and lending leads to a widening global balance, we want to be sure to indicate, let it be. Don't necessarily jump at a widening global balance. Uh, noting that, 
there are many reasons why there will be disruptions in our part of the world or in the global economy more generally. And a widening global balance identified in the IMF report as portending, uh, you know, protectionist tit for tat as predicting the possibility for sudden reversals of capital account and capital flows. There are many reasons why there's protectionist tit for tat. So we uh, want to just put widening global balances in perspective. From our angle, all the reasons that Jay Wu has mentioned also operate on us. COVID has been a factor. Commodities, the Russia-Ukraine conflict has been a factor. Tightening U.S. monetary policy has been a factor. But I might add also, for a lot of us in the emerging world, China's growth is hugely consequential. And when we see perturbations in China's growth trajectory, that injects uncertainty and instability into our own economies. And part of that is probably showing up in the way capital is flowing around the world, leading to this widening global balance. All right, Back to you, please. All right, we're going to delve into a lot of the issues that you just brought up. But, Jawu, you see mm -hmm. this trend changing this year. Why? Are we at an inflection point? I wouldn't go that far, but we are expecting change, exact, uh, to be more specific. We are expecting the global current account balances to narrow a little bit this year, mm -hmm. and more so gradually in the next couple of, in the next couple of years. Main reason being the two important factors, the effects of the pandemic and the effects of the war in Ukraine are expected to unwind or, or recede. Uh, uh, but having said that, we are not necessarily expecting it to shrink, and we do not want it to, as Danny said, and we all seem to be agreeing. And so for the past couple of years, it was a little bit of agitated state in terms of global current account balances, and we are expecting that agitation uh, to gradually fade. So I would put it more like that rather than a uh, big change in the long-term trend. Mark, I want to bring you into the conversation. A big driver of capital flows is the value of the U.S. dollar, which of course is set in turn by U.S. monetary policy. As the U.S. Federal Reserve nears the end of its rate tightening cycle and looks to hold rates at higher levels for longer, and as other central banks around the world are raising rates, uh, what impact do you see global monetary policy having on uh, capital flows and the potential for dislocations? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, on what Jay Wu just said, I, I wanted to also point out that the U.S. current account deficit expanded rather sharply uh, in the last year or two perhaps underpinned by the fiscal stimulus uh, and the pandemic uh, consequences. Um, and so the, some of those forces are abating as well, which should uh, underpin your, your projections. Mm -hmm. um, your question. So um, it's almost a question about a foreign exchange forecast. Uh, <laughs> capital flows and foreign exchange, uh, they, rates go hand in hand. Um, and so, it reminded me of two things I heard in my career from very senior officials. This is early in my career. And one told me that anybody who thinks he knows where foreign exchange rates are headed is a fool. <laughs> and uh, the second one said, well, if I knew the answer to those questions, I'd be on Wall Street making millions. Right. I wouldn't be here at the Treasury. Of course. Um, so with that preface. Um, uh, look, obviously, the course of U.S. rates will be one of the key determinants for foreign exchange uh, rates and capital flows this year. It's hardly going to be the only one. Um, as you uh, suggest, the baseline expectation is right now that the Fed, after one or two more um, hikes, um, is going to be on hold for a while. Um, Markets, I think, see a turn perhaps in the first quarter of uh, next year. Um, and so I, I think if the Fed is uh, on hold, that will um, curb major shifts in uh, global capital flows. Um, now, we saw last week that there was a better U.S. inflation print, um, and um, market rates came off uh, quite a bit, and the dollar eased. 
I think that once the market um, anticipates that the Fed is imminently entering cutting mode, um, and again, many expect that'll be around Q1 next year, but we'll see, um, the dollar could experience some decent selling pressure. But again, this is all a guess, guesswork. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, um, you know, it, it takes two to tango, so it's not just what happens in the U.S., but it, what happens elsewhere that's going to shape capital flows. Uh, and exchange rates, you know, I think there's questions about um, how will flows uh, with respect to Europe be impacted um, by the outlook for ECB hikes and in the face of European stagnation, uh, flows to Japan could be impacted by adjustments in yield curve control, good performing um, emerging markets. Um, that had raised rates uh, preemptively, uh, have experienced some good flows. Uh, capital flows to China have been relatively flat since the uh, beginning of the Russian invasion. So um, it will, it's guesswork. We'll see what happens, but uh, hopefully that's some useful context. Danny, typically when we see the U.S. dollar appreciate, we see capital flowing out of emerging markets. How do you see capital flows for emerging markets being impacted, given where we are in the global rate hiking cycle? Yeah, Jennifer, I, I think two things are going to matter going forwards. One is the expectations that people have in emerging markets of what's going to happen to U.S. monetary policy, what's going to happen to U.S. interest rates. But second, importantly, what uncertainties remain in the global economy. Uh, I think we'll all agree at this point that the U.S. rate hike sequence is probably reaching the end of its momentum. You know, U.S. rates have risen by five percentage points. Uh, you know, inflation has fallen from seven percent last year now to under four percent this year. Even if that's still two percentage points higher, there are long and variable lags in monetary policy. I think everyone is aligned on the view that the U.S. rate hike sequence is coming to an end. Uh, surveys of expectation inflation, uh, inflation expectations in the U.S. are also similarly on the decline. Now, all of that might suggest, as you say, a turnaround of the this this phenomenon of capital flows uphill from the emerging markets to the United States uh, to the advanced economies. But uncertainties remain, and those uncertainties are going to figure prominently. And as long as they do, the U.S. economy, U.S. markets are going to remain a safe haven. Um, that safe haven nature of the American market will continue to drive capital flows uphill. And um, unless we are able to bring around these uncertainties surrounding performance in the rest of the global economy, we might continue to see global balances widen and this capital flows uphill exacerbated. Jawu, how much do you expect the U.S. dollar to appreciate this year, especially when advanced economies are continuing to raise interest rates? Yeah, great question. Uh, the very important answer to that is what actually Mark just said in the beginning, uh, two wise words from uh, the gurus. And relating to that, we at the IMF do not forecast the exchange rate. The reason is that one outcome or one consensus of years of research by the economics profession, as well as us in the IMF, is something like near impossibility of forecasting exchange rate. There are so many factors and forces that hit exchange rate market in any given instance, which really eludes our, I guess I might even say, human capacity to foretell. Having said that, the best we can do is to elaborate on current forces that we, fo we can see that might be affecting exchange rate in one way or the other. One important factor is the result of our own report, which says there are some reasons for an eventual, let me emphasize eventual, weakening of the U.S. dollar, largely because of the current account deficit, which has been at a pretty high level. And then there are elements that Mark alluded to. Also, Danny mentioned U.S. monetary tightening coming to an end, 
while other advanced economies, there seem to be quite some way to go. That would also tend to weaken dollar exchange rate. Contrary to that, uncertainty that again have been alluded to, any resurgence of global uncertainty and risk, uh, risk aversion, what we call, would tend to strengthen US dollar. So as a result, there are always uh, conflicting forces. And it's, uh, we probably should shy away from uh, forecasting the direction or size of dollar movement with too much confidence. Right, well, we're talking about different risks or factors that can impact global capital flows. Mark, the U.S. Treasury is in the midst of issuing a massive amount of U.S. Treasuries uh, through September. How do you expect this issuance to impact global capital flows? Thanks. Uh, uh, first of all, just one point on something Danny said, um, which is that I do think that the uh, if I'm not mistaken, that some of the, as I mentioned earlier, some of the good performing EMs that had raised rates preemptively as the Fed was moving higher um, have been getting um, some good capital flows. Uh, I think some of the data that I've seen, particularly from the Institute for International Finance, uh, um, show that, but not China. Um, in terms of your question, um, I don't really see this as a big deal. Um, so with the lifting of the debt ceiling, um, the Treasury has already been replenishing its cash balances. It's been at it for a while. Um, maybe it's got another month or two to go. Um, this has seemed to go fairly smoothly um, as reverse repo facility balances have been drawn down. Um, as I mentioned, we saw a decent inflation print last week, and you saw rates tumble despite stepped-up Treasury uh, borrowing and Treasury uh, increased uh, borrowing to replenish its cash, cash balances. Um, obviously, our, they have to finance uh, the deficit as well, which is uh, considerable. But uh, I think the course of U.S. inflation and monetary policy, and let's not forget fundamentals elsewhere, is what's going to be the driver of capital flows, um, not this uh, current uptick in Treasury borrowing. Jawu, commodity prices have come down from a year mm -hmm. ago, yet the war in Ukraine rages on. You said earlier uh, in, in this conversation that you expect a bit of unwinding of yeah. that impact mm -hmm. and that it's difficult to uh, forecast the direction of the U.S. dollar. But given the potential for fluctuations in the U.S. dollar taken together with these other factors, uh, how do these dynamics impact the outlook for uh, countries that are commodity exporters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and those that are importers? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so despite the well-known uncertainty about the exchange rate, the movement of commodity prices are, have been happening already in the sense that commodity prices have come down quite a bit since the peak of last year. And no uh, big rebound or change in the direction is expected. If any, we are all expecting commodity prices to come down a little more. In that event, uh, it will tend to reduce global current account balances, despite all the caveat that we and Danny uh, uh, explained in, in, uh, in great, uh, with great efficiency uh, effect, uh, is that commodity exporters will thus, have, will thus see their surplus to decline, while commodity importers will tend to see less need to pay for their commodity imports. So therefore, either their deficit will become smaller, uh, or if they are also uh, surplus countries, the surplus will tend to a little increase. So taken all together, the tendency will be commodity surplus countries running smaller surplus, importers tending to have less deficit, thus narrowing global current account balances. One very striking example would be European countries, which really had to pay big imports for their gas imports from Russia. Okay, well, Jiawu, uh, switching gears a bit, uh, countries have really been turning inward uh, since the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because we've seen a lot of issues with supply chain, and as a result, mm -hmm. there's been quite a bit of onshoring. It raises the question whether globalization is moving backwards. 
My question is, do you expect this trend to continue or do you think we'll see a reversion to globalization pre-pandemic as supply chain issues are resolved and China's economy reopens and normalizes? Yeah, that actually is a very important and also a very complex question. Mm. It can be viewed both in terms of uh, near term and more longer term perspective. Maybe I can focus on near term perspective in, in my reaction. In a way, with the pandemic effect being unwound and supply chain normalizing, we are already seeing some tendency to return to pre-pandemic trend. Uh, goods imports, goods trade, which have picked up a lot because people are spending more on commodities and goods, uh, shying away from services which require person-to-person -person interaction during the pandemic, that has begun to come down. While uh, normalization of supply chains allow the prices to decline a little bit. On the service side, uh, service trade has been returning together with consumption of restaurants and travels domestically. One interesting example I read recently is what some cities, some major cities in the world regard as over-touring, uh, stalking anti-tourist rhetoric in some of those cities. So it's a sign of return. But that's more of the short-term development. In the long term, all the factors that you mentioned and the uh, security concerns beginning to bear upon trade issues, which were more or less purely economic consideration, uh, throw, uh, poses a very complica complicated question mm -hmm. where the trend of globalization will go. That's the whole story of fragmentation. But maybe I can I, I can pause there for my. That's answer. probably a whole another conversation, right, yes. right? For another for another yeah. panel, Danny. Let me come to you. How do you see China's economy reopening impacting global trade flows and supply chains? Yeah, well, you know, Jennifer, for for many of us here in East Asia, China is the engine of growth. In fact, for most of the world, for which China is the number one trading partner nation. China is the, the driving engine of growth. This week, America has had the luxury of switching its largest trading partner from China to Mexico. Most of the rest of the world continues unchanged in that regard. So when we see strong renewed growth in China, we think that we might. Uh, confidence surges. Uh, we think of it as a boost to economic growth. And whatever renewed growth in China might do to you know, IMF's concerns over global balance, for many of us in this part of the world, it is no bad thing that China returns to the kind of growth trajectory that we are used to. And even this is even if all the rest of East Asia are fully convinced now on the idea that we need to build up resilience in supply chains, we can't be too heavily dependent on a single link anywhere. There's no reason to think that we can't build more supply chains, increase resilience, but also still draw on China's economic growth. There's no, you know, in labor economics, we, we laugh at people who say there's a fixed, there's a fixed lump of labor. Well, there need be no fixed lump of supply chain, we can all use China's return to the global economy. That's the good news. And in that regard, in East Asia, we're not so concerned about the global balance issue, except to the extent, well, two things. One is, turns out China is doing, isn't doing particularly well right about now. Mm -hmm. uh, the indications that we're getting in East Asia from, from out of China is that movie going is up, so that's good. Subway travel is up, that's good. Passenger flights continue to rise, that's good, but auto sales are flat. Youth unemployment in China is at a record high. Consumer spending is unchanged. Trade is not growing. So, um, you know, we're kind of caught in a bind. We want China to, to return full-throated to its growth trajectory. We're not getting that. People's Bank of China actually cut interest rates by 10 basis points last month, unlike, you know, America's, uh, America's central bank's rush to raise interest rates. In this part of the world, interest rates are moving in the opposite direction. And that's to try and get a restoration of a growth trajectory that is badly needed. My final thought on this is that uh, while 
you know, we want China's economic performance to improve in Asia, we are also cognizant that geopolitical tensions remain and geoeconomic fragmentation in our reading uh, is a good possibility whose risks rise the more strongly China performs. So we're caught in a real bind here from geopolitical rivalry, recovery from COVID, the commodity, uh, commodity inflation, and China's tentativeness right now. I don't see any clear ways out at this point. Yeah, Mark, kind of building on that point, the Biden administration has been preparing an executive order now for months that would restrict U.S. investment into China. And part of that rationale is to try to stop Beijing's military from getting access to cutting-edge technology from the U.S., semiconductors, artificial intelligence. Um, and, and this coming after China banned major Chinese companies from purchasing U.S. chips from U.S. technology company Micron back in May, citing national security issues, uh, it raises a specter for tit-for-tat escalation. Uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has tried to quell this, but how do you see this factoring into global trade? This is a great question. Um, so let me let me cast it a bit more generally. Uh, as you said, there's a lot of talk about fragmentation, decoupling, and the global economy uh, descending into blocks. Uh, Danny J. Wu has been making this point. Uh, so first of all, I want to shout out the IMF, uh, led by uh, Pierre-Olivier Gorinchis, the research director. The fund has rightly and eloquently written that the world has benefited uh, enormously from globalization in past decades, uh, and it's lifted billions out of poverty. And in doing so, uh, I think the IMF's voice provides a very important public service. Now, we can't be naive, though. Uh, national security concerns are going to weigh on economic interactions. U.S.-China tensions are there, especially on advanced semiconductors, as you noted, and other cutting-edge technologies that are going to uh, have possible military application. Um, beyond that, there are the unwise Trump tariff cuts, which the Biden administration hasn't taken down. Um, Picking up on something Danny said, uh, I think the pandemic showed that supply chains were built for just-in-time perfection, um, but they weren't resilient. Uh, it's not wise to put all, you, all your eggs in one basket. So some diversification and reshoring, for example, moving from China to uh, Vietnam or Mexico, for example, it's a decent idea. I think uh, businesses may very well be keen to do that, provided the costs uh, don't soar. Um, I still think there's good business to be done between the U.S. and China on um, uh, matters or items that don't impinge on national security. So on balance, I would say reading the tea leaves, some fragmentation is already baked in the cake. Um, perhaps we're past peak globalization, as some people suggest, although I'm not sure what, what all that means or how you measure it exactly. Um, it's my hope that the world will still continue to benefit from existing large-scale interdependencies. Um, I'm not sure I'm ready to buy in so far into massive losses to global efficiency and GDP, as some estimates suggest under uh, what I think might be swinging assumptions. Um, but one can't rule it out if uh, U.S.-China tensions um, on the economic front continue to surge. Well, Jia Wu, if we do continue mm -hmm. to see fragmentation, tensions, uh, Danny brought up the prospect of China's economy slowing based on the recent economic data, pointing to the IMF's forecast of mm -hmm. slower global mm -hmm. growth this year mm -hmm. and also the warning for uh, potential recession in advanced economies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, certainly, we've seen stresses in the banking sector um, come down after we saw some bank failures earlier this year. We have seen some credit tightening on the margins. But if global growth were to slow further or we were to see advanced economies mm -hmm. tip into recession, you know, how does that bode for global capital flows and trade? Yeah. So that's something that we discussed a little bit in our report also. So far, the banking turmoil has not had material effects on flows of goods and services and capital, largely because of very strong policy reaction. But the risk of hard landing in advanced economies is, is, is real, and it's one of the key questions uh, on people's mind. 
if that were to happen, uh, typically when there is a global downturn and tightening of financial conditions, what we call risk aversion tends to also rise, and that leads to dollar appreciation and all the negative spillovers, which we also discussed in one of our chapters. Overall, that would result in global capital flow uh, declining compared to otherwise, and especially emerging economies with large external vulnerabilities, such as large external debt, tend to suffer disproportionately. They would have a difficult time financing their deficit needs and will have to cut down their activity and imports. All right, well, let's talk about recommendations, what we do about all of this. Building on uh, your, your last answer there, Zhao Wu, um, is there a way to inspire confidence for mm -hmm. investors who are investing in emerging markets when the value of the U.S. dollar appreciates so that they're not yanking out uh, their capital, or is this really just the fact of the global reserve currency and the relationships that exist? Yeah, I would be a little more optimistic there. There are things to be done. Uh, we would, maybe one can say str strengthening economic fundamentals and policy framework. That's actually a broad message that we in the IMF continue to convey through flagship reports, not just ours, but World Economic Outlook, uh, GFSR, and Fiscal Monitor, as well as bilateral interactions we have with uh, individual countries. But it's a long, hard work, requires tenacity. Uh, it takes time to, for it to bear fruit. But in the meantime, more narrowly related to our external sector report, we found flexible exchange rate and having better anchored inflation expectations, which usually come with a stronger monetary policy framework, tend to help soften the negative spillover from uh, dollar appreciation as well as uh, rising global risk aversion. Because in, th in those countries, they can uh, discharge policies which will soften the impact on the economies. Mm -hmm. Mark, how can we bring uh, policymakers and international institutions together uh, to really mount the challenges posed by the U.S. global dollar cycle? So, first of all, I want to step back for a second, and I want to say that in my personal opinion, and I'm, lots of people are going to disagree with me, I think much of the academic um, focus on a global dollar cycle is misplaced and overdone. Of course, the dollar is the world's dominant currency, and of course, Fed monetary policy impacts the world. Of course, that's an absolute given. But um, I find that um, emerging markets are often, they're, they're too diverse to be lumped together. So China, to me, is in its own category. Um, then there's good performers with decent fundamentals, large buffers, floating exchange rates, local currency, bond markets, some of the things Jay Wu just alluded to. For example, there's solid performers in Asia, Central Europe, uh, Latin America. And then there are poor performers with weak fundamentals. Uh, I'm going to get in trouble, but uh, you, know, you can say Argentina, Pakistan, Egypt, Sri Lanka, Turkey. I'm probably in big trouble now. <laughs> um, but it would be laughable to say that their problems are due to a global dollar cycle. So, Good performers know the Fed has a domestically oriented mandate, and it's going to do what's in the U.S. interest. Um, and frankly, in my view, the Fed's pursuit of stability at home is in the world's interest. Now, Canada and Mexico, there are no two, there are no more countries in the world than these two that are impacted by the U.S., but you don't see them talking all that much about a global dollar cycle because they focus on their fundamentals and their buffers. So. To keep it short, what's to be done? Um, we live in a world of nation states, so there's no true global lender of last resort. Uh, hence, we have a patchy, messy, what we call a global financial safety net. Uh, look, if there's a big global crisis, the Fed's going to step in to uh, protect the global dollar system. We saw that in the pandemic. We saw that in the global financial crisis. Um, foremost, as Jay Wu just said, countries need to strengthen their fundamentals and buffers. Good performers facing liquidity issues 
can also resort to foreign exchange intervention, capital flow measures, and the like, though they shouldn't use those as a substitute for um, sound macro policies and adjustments. And one has to be wary because capital controls can have quite the deterrent impact on uh, future investment. Um, the IMF can also help good performers with its crisis prevention tools, its precautionary instruments. For others, the IMF acts as a conditional bounce of payments lender um, through its resolution tools. Now, how the IMF assesses the bounce between cases of illiquidity and solvency, how the IMF designs its tools, uh, and questions about the demand for them could keep us here for hours, so I'll stop there. Mark, though, I'm just curious because this report, the external uh, sector report, was developed at a time when foreign exchange tensions were quite high. Uh, China had a big surplus, emerging market economies had uh, ample reserves. We've seen a reversal really since then. Uh, certainly, China's surplus has come down. How relevant is really this report still? So I think this is a very good and important question. Um, so people joke that IMF stands for it's mostly fiscal, and there's a good bit of truth to that. But the IMF was created uh, to prevent competitive beggar thy neighbor uh, exchange rate policies and to um, curb the bilateralization of exchange rate disputes. So to me, the ESR's analysis of external imbalances, particularly excess external imbalances, exchange rate valuations and reserves, that's key to fulfilling the IMF's core functions. Um, and we all know the world would be better off and healthier if global imbalances were tackled with what we in the G20 used to call strong, sustainable imbalance growth. So now disputes uh, over external policies come and go, as you said. Um, think back to the plaza era. Or in, you know, in my career in the last 15, uh, 20 years, we saw huge disputes about um, the China's, the RMB's valuation. Um, Asian reserve accumulation, the size of German current account surpluses. Um, and then there were allegations that the U.S. was trying to uh, depreciate the dollar through currency wars when, in fact, we were just pursuing uh, quantitative easing. So as the ESR shows, excess savings and investment bounces and flawed policies are going to give rise to current account and exchange rate tensions. That can foster protectionism. So I, I'd say that even if the ESR issues are not front and center at this moment, they'll be back. Um, and the IMF should stay at the analytic forefront. Um, and frankly, I'm not sure that some of these issues aren't uh, bubbling beneath the surface, so to speak. Uh, I've noticed um, uh, some public quibbling lately about the depreciation of the R and B, even if this is a function of a relative monetary policy divergence between the U.S. and China. Um, there are major questions you can read all the time about: Will Germany uh, is Germany's export-led growth model viable, and will it be sustained? Um, countries around the world ask if the U.S. is capable of running responsible fiscal policies, and what does this mean for uh, external imbalances? Um, so those questions are there. I guess one last point is that um, good IMF external analysis is not sufficient in and of itself. The IMF needs to take the analysis and offer crisp external policy and exchange rate judgments and findings in its in relevant Article IV cases. The IMF also um, needs to more forcefully advocate for uh, transparency in foreign exchange practices around the world. Um, so I think those are some uh, weak spots that the IMF uh, could st strengthen its performance on. Mm -hmm. Danny, let me come to you. Uh, the report notes that currency volatility can significantly impact emerging market economies and it includes some recommendations to manage that volatility. I'm curious whether you agree with these or if there are other strategies or policy frameworks in your view that may work better to effectively manage exchange rate fluctuations and sort of minimize the impact on trade competitiveness. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jennifer. I, I, I want to very quickly say that there is one key word that I might use to, to answer your question, and that is greater cooperation. 
across different parts of the world. And I want to say that in the context of you know the discussion that you've just had with Mark and, and Jay Wu, I, I think that there are, in, in terms of whether what currency volatility does, what American monetary policy does, the, the potential negative impact on the rest of the world, there seem to be two extreme views. I, I don't want to suggest that any single individual holds either extreme, but there are two extreme views out there. One is that, you know, there's sort of the, the populists of the world who say that, you know, America through its monetary policy has willfully destabilized the rest of the world, not paying any attention to what other structural weaknesses there are in the rest of the world. And then there's the, the other extreme, which is that, well, there are fundamentals, political and economic fundamental weaknesses in so much of the rest of the world. That's your problem. It's not for America to try and fix that. And unless you get your house in shape, whatever we do with monetary policy is going to be problematic. You know, my own view to answer your question is that the real world is probably something in between. And we need some kind of systematic solution that does not point the finger of blame at either side of this. Uh, yes, fundamentals are probably we are likely weak in many other parts of the world, and they can do better. But that's a long-term problem, and you cannot expect them over the course of an interest rate hike cycle to be completely uh, worked through. The adjustment path on repairing fundamentals in the rest of the world uh, is going to be long-term. And it can be either smooth or it can be disrupted. It can be disrupted by uh, monetary policy in, in strong, advanced economy parts of the world. It's true, exactly as Mark says, we don't now have an international lender of last resort. However, we do have de facto a world reserve currency. And we cannot sidestep, evade the fact that what Amer when America does what it does with monetary policy, it has huge implications on the rest of the world. Now, it's very appropriate for America to raise interest rates when it seeks to lower domestic inflation. It's very appropriate that America adjusts interest rates in light of its economic conditions. But America does not have to be bullshy about the way it exercises its monetary policy. And yes, that's a technical term. The more modern version is America does not have to be a Karen about how its monetary policy impacts the rest of the world. There's every argument for how America can still conduct good monetary policy, but take into consideration helping the rest of the world with fundamentals not yet as strong to make smooth trajectories. There is no big reveal in the world today that across the world, emerging economies are either systematically weaker or stronger that they are in a fragile position is exogenous to them. It comes from instability and uncertainty in the global economy. And yes, part of it comes from the way America's monetary policy has been conducted. So my key word for, for fixing the current volat currency volatility situation, for fixing the global economy, is we need to build a kind of collaboration that gives the whole world greater confidence and security that the global economy will actually still be a thing that will not splinter into groups. All right. Well, gentlemen, we'll have to leave the conversation there, but fantastic discussion. Thanks so much to all three of you for your insights. So appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you.